Hi, everybody. Darren here. Hey, it's great to have you here with us today on the Blink Podcast. Today's topic is, are you engaging with your marketplace or are you waiting for your market to engage with you? This is a hot topic right now, one that I'm going to explore with my good mate, Jonathan Creek. We'll be right with you after this. Hey everybody, Darren here, Blink Podcast. What a great platform to be able to have some really important discussions about what's going on in the marketplace right now and how to help you and your business develop in this challenging environment. But to introduce my good friend and co-host, Jonathan Creek. Hey Jonathan, great to see you, mate. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Darren. Great to be back. Great to be back talking about challenging environments. Your intro. <laughs> I know. It's the horns, the car's going past the outside, mate. It's not easy. Good to be back. How are you? I'm good. What's in there? Well, you know, I think there's, I think the market, the market is the market is the market and it's just changing. It's so, yeah, it's almost the complete opposite of what we've been dealing with in the last couple of years that we've gone from everybody... Yeah frozen to now everybody trying all new things and different things happening and you know, i'm a problem solver so i i yeah it's like it's like it's like i've walked into games world and the world business world is just full of puzzles to solve and uh, yeah. yeah it's real cool it's interesting i think one of the big things for me too is is we've been in an environment for the last two to three years that is uh being very frothy and and there's been lots of activity and and everybody's been either you know depending on your industry you've had some really tough times or you've had some really amazing times right and then all of a sudden right now i think we're starting to see on both sides of the ditch we're seeing uh, a marketplace that isn't playing ball by the standard rules it has got a lot tougher in terms of the way we do business and when you compare what we've had over the last two or three years this is a whole new ball game and, and i think you did right that whole puzzle piece of businesses going to work out where they're at what they're doing where they're going is is a definite puzzle for many that are being really challenged to work out exactly what they look like yeah i think how do i put it i think what we're seeing at the moment is we're seeing a run into christmas that favors the brave <laughs> Mate, that's the word. That is the word. I wrote that up while I was doing a coaching session yesterday with a with a, a high performer yesterday, and that was one of the words I wrote up. In fact, it's up there on my whiteboard. Brave, um, and and you're so right. I think now courageous and brave and clarity is just the key words right now, eh? And and you've got to be understanding what that's going to mean for you leading into Christmas and uh, and into next year. And the reason why I say favours the brave, because I think people are a bit more brittle than what they used to be. I'm definitely yeah. more brittle than what I used to be. You know the struggle that I had yesterday, just trying to send a packet of life savers through the post. All right? And I organised to send that out. I'd blocked out time, 9 till 10 in the morning to go and get it done. All printed, all done and dusted. See you later. 25 mail outs done, reaching out to my key clients. That was it, right? And then I had the rest of the day to do work. But of course, it didn't la It didn't go from ten, nine till ten, did it? Because when I got down to the post office, the post office decided that the lifesavers were going to cost me nine dollars to send, and I got a real bee in my bonnet. Then they said they're too fat. Then I was like, seriously, why can't we just put these in an envelope and send them? And it derailed my whole day. I think I went to three different post offices trying to hack the system, where I should have just. Just post them, mate. Just post them. All right. Don't be so brittle. Can I, you, you're trying to be brave. Can I just ask, can I just ask a question, mate? Uh, where are they sitting at the moment? Are they here? Sorry, where? Oh, so they haven't been posted yet. It's all right, everyone. I'm just taking the piss. Cause, cause, They're not yeah, the gars, by the way. They, they look so good, mate. Ready to go. They're going to be so nice when your actually customer receives them instead of sitting in that box in your office. It's a little treasure map sort of thing in there, and then the lifesavers at the I know what's in there. It's very, very cool, mate. You've done a very clever, clever piece of marketing there, and uh, it's so nice sitting there in your office waiting for I don't know somebody to deliver them to the post shop and get them posted. Oh well, yeah, nine bucks. 
to put them in a satchel where I could put up to five kilograms for the same price, I feel as I'm un, I'm not taking advantage of the moment. You know what I mean? So right. I felt like as right. my right. daughter, yeah, yeah. we're moving on, mate. We're moving on. Look, seriously, my, if, no, we, no, no, if we carry we on this topic, if we carry on this topic, mate, we could be here for the whole hour talking well, about as my daughter, savers, as my daughter says, as my daughter says, it sounds like a bit of a do off. She means rip off. A what? She says do off. Oh, yeah. She means rip off. So yeah. uh, anyway, we move on. We move on today. It's all about engaging the market, being brave, moving into Christmas. Yeah. Uh, doing the things that others aren't doing, doing the things that other people look at you and say, what are you doing that for? When really what they're just doing is projecting their own insecurities onto you, doing the things that are going to get you so busy in January that you're going to, you're going to wish that you've got Easter off because you're going to be so busy and you're not, but Hey, don't be scared about being in Jan busy in January. Cause guess what's worse being quiet in January particularly in real estate, because if you're quiet in January, you ain't getting paid till Easter. So do you want to know one thing worse than do you want to know one thing worse than quiet in January? Quiet in February. Knowing that you're going to be quiet in January in December. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> you imagine going into Christmas with Christmas lunch, knowing that you haven't got your game on for January. What's your game like then? And that, and that makes a massive difference, mate. That that makes a really big headspace difference. So, you know, making sure you've got good plans, got good business in place into the new year um, means you can go and have a Christmas knowing that you've got all that in place. So, so and I, I'm going to add to your courageous and brave because uh, when you think about what we've had over the last couple of years, one of the things that I've seen, especially in real estate, automotive, uh, financial services, a lot of those industries were where the customer actually came to you, the business owner, right? So, oh, look, I can't travel. I've got some money in the bank. Let's just go and buy a car. Oh, I've got money. Um, we can't go anywhere. Maybe we should buy a house. Maybe we should buy an investment property. Maybe we should upgrade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the consumer made a whole lot of decisions and decided to come to us. So we, we were in a, in, in a business market where basically if you sat in the office and waited for the phone to ring, guess what actually happened? It yeah. rang and yeah, people were right. actually... You know, and, and a whole lot of, and, and one that I talk about a lot is my uh, real estate agents who are brand new to the industry over the last two or three years. So you get them to come in, they fluke their first, this so they fluke their first open home, or sorry, fluke their first listing, they do their first open home. How many people turned up to the open home? Um, about 30, right? Mm. So how many people wanted to buy the house? Oh, 20. And then how many wanted to sell the house? Oh, six. So next minute, you got the next listing, right? So next minute, all these real estate agents who came into the industry over this period of time said, you know what? Real estate is easy. You don't have to work that hard and you make shit loads of money. So this, this is the industry for me. But also now the wind's changed and now we've got an environment where the customer isn't coming to you. Now we are going to sit back a bit and wait to see what the market does. And all of a sudden, we've got a whole lot of people sitting in the office still looking at their phones. Yeah, I find that interesting. I also find the car industry interesting interesting at the moment because there is such a delay on stock so unless you actually yeah. want one of the cars sitting in the yard you know you you could be getting your customers to wait anywhere between six to 12 months for a vehicle now how demotivating is that for a salesperson to say i've got to try and sell cars that i know we don't have yet or aren't yeah. going to get anytime soon so you know that you you're walking the customer towards sort of maybe a short-term disappointment in a way. Like you're going to leave them a yeah. little bit flat. They've made the big yep. decision to buy. They just want the keys and to get going. And you're sitting there saying, yep. well, could be 12 weeks, could be 25 weeks. You know, I'm not sure. And I mean, that's just the world we live in at the moment, but you really do just have to keep it going. One of my dealerships just got given 250 vehicles. So they got, so they've been stalled on delivery for the last, I don't know, probably six, 12 months, right? And next minute, the boat arrives, and they got two hundred and fifty cars to deliver. You know, like that—that's that's a major. That's a good problem to have, but boy, that's a major headache. And for for a start, where the hell do you put them? 
you know, while you're, while you're getting ready to deliver them, you've got to put them somewhere. So, you know, there's lots and lots of different challenges that are coming at us right now. And this is the part where it's just thinking about, hey, how are we going to make sure we get through this next couple of months and make sure we position ourselves for 2023? Yeah, because there's always a solution. I mean, I just came back from Tasmania. Obviously, I was in New Zealand with you recently, which was fantastic. What a what a great time that was. Amazing to think it was the first time that we'd actually met face-to-face, which was crazy. Um, but, yeah. But you don't look much different in real life, mate, to tell you the truth. Just a bit shorter, a bit fatter, you know, as we all do. But anyway, I was in Tasmania, and I made the brave decision of going down to Tasmania via the Spirit, the boat. And uh, when I was on the boat on the uh, on the way back, I met a guy at one of the one of the rooms where you watch TV, one of the sort of lounge areas. And he was a truck driver, and his job is to go down to Tasmania and pick up all these brand new Ford Rangers and uh, Hiluxes, all these new sort of things that aren't selling in Tasmania. And then he's delivering them to dealerships throughout sort of. Australia. So these dealers are dealing amongst each other with their stock. And his job basically yeah. is just, he drives around the country taking these new cars that sure. aren't selling in Tassie because there's only half a million people in Tassie. Um, so they can sure. get to people right. in, in uh, mainland Australia. So there's always a solution. Awesome. That's very cool. All right. Let's get on to today. Uh, what did you coin the topic? I was too busy uh, laughing about your challenges in the industry. Yeah. Engaging the market? Engage the market, market. yeah. And I think the thing is for me here, we've got to be having a think about all the ways that we as business owners can actually go to the market and not wait for the market to come to us, right? Because one of the things that I want us to be thinking about today is this market isn't behaving like it normally does. There's a whole lot of reasons why customers are willing to keep their hands in their pockets and not do anything. Um, And we've got to realize that actually creating some engagement with the market is going to be really, really important here. Yeah, I think we're seeing it uh, across the board, uh, especially in real estate. We're seeing the rise of independent brands, right? Independent operators, and the one thing they do better, like, well, the ones that are standing out anyway, maybe there are a whole lot out there that we don't see because they're not doing this well, but the ones who are causing the ripples, the waves in the industries, the one thing they have locked down is they know how to engage their market. They're just so yep. clever, so nimble, and so human to human that they end up winning big deals and big settlements and big sales. And we saw it with yep. uh, Novax on on the on the past weekend. They sold that record twenty one and a half million dollar property in Manly, and they're not even a real estate agent in Manly. They're just better at engaging the community, and it stretches beyond their patch. And this is what you And I heard that they had to close off the street, mate. Mate, it was like a block auction. Uh, Mark Novak is just a genius when it comes to this sort of engagement. Uh, they had you know, coffee vans. They had uh, crowd controllers. They had uh, their other salespeople almost working like reporters reporting on the lead up to it in the two hours before on Facebook. Like it was, it was, it was just excellent how they did it. And it really has, I think, set the cat amongst the pigeons amongst real estate agents in Sydney. You know, the big guys with the big brands, they'd be sitting there in their boardrooms this week scratching their heads saying, how do we miss out on that one? And I reckon we're hitting the topic today. The reason, I can tell you right now, I won't name them, but I'll tell you right now, you missed out on this because you do not engage your community on a human-to-human level. You don't do it. You've got a box cut, you've got a... I was going to say box cutter approach, but that's not what it is. You've got an approach where people have to fit into your system or they fall out and the world's moved on. It's not how it works anymore. Yeah. The market's changed. No. Absolutely. All right. So, mate, one of the things that I've done is I've identified nine key ways that we should be engaging with the market. All right. So what I want to do is maybe if we just uh, work our way through these uh, and and maybe have a talk about some of these as we go. Look so. um. Look at this as technology there. This is fantastic, mate. That's very cool. That's number two, actually. Is that page number two? Is that the wrong page? No, it's yeah, well, page. you don't need that one just yet. This is page number one. Is this what you need? No, not yet. That's the, that's the second conversation. Oh, don't tell me. Production issues. Yeah. 
Right. No, that's good. Right. Number one. Let's talk about number one. And this is my famous 10 calls a day. 10 calls a day. This is the piece that I just really struggle with, right, is getting salespeople to understand that having to make these 10 calls a day is not like a voluntary thing. It's not like an optional. It's like breathing. As a salesperson, you have to do 10 calls a day. And you need to have 10 conversations with people, whether it's referral network, whether it's past clients, whether it's new clients, whether it's people that came to open homes, it's whether it's people that walked onto your car yard, it's whether it's people that walked into your office for some advice. You have got to talk and make these connections 10 a day's minimum for me, right? I went to uh, a presentation a couple of weeks ago by uh, another uh, speaker and they were talking about a sales philosophy where they were making 20 calls a day as part of the gig. So I I say 10 calls a day to get you on the move and start creating that habit is key, but it's the best way to engage the market, you know? And, and I, I think right now, if you're not tough on yourself about those 10 calls, you are seriously missing a great opportunity to engage the market because I think as consumers, we know out there right now, they need more help, they need more advice, and they need these bigger conversations. And I think they're critical. Yeah, it's funny, you know, because cold calling is something that a lot of people get icky about. I definitely, when you say, oh, you got to make 10, a call, 10 calls a day, I go, oh, but I don't, you know, who am I going to call? And you panic. The thing is to sit there and not try and think about who are the 10. Just think about who are the next two, get them done. Then sit there and go, okay, who are the next two, get them done. Who are the next two? And do that and maybe break it up and do five in the morning and five just before lunch. Like, it's amazing what the brain will do to stop people from making those calls. You know, I remember I used to sit at my desk in this exact office and I'd sit there and go, oh, it's 2.35. No one wants to be called at 2.35. They've probably just had a 2.30 meeting start, so I'm going to be ringing right at the start of the meeting. So I'm going to, I'm going to wait till 5 to 3 when that meeting finishes, and then I'll get to 5 to 3 and I'll go, oh, no, no, no one wants to get called at 3 o'clock because they'll just be getting ready to go into their 3 o'clock meeting. And then I go 3.30, oh, no, no, they might be picking their kids up from school. And your brain just comes up with these incredible amount of excuses of why you shouldn't be making the calls. <laughs> you've, got to flip the, you've got to flip the mindset, right? You've got to flip the mindset and understand that these, if you've got a decent business with a decent product and you're actually decent at doing your job, you're actually doing them a favor by reaching out to them because you're removing their pain for a problem that they haven't had time to get around to solve just yet. And you're just walking in the door and hold it, handing them a package and saying, let me take care of that for you. We'll get it done. And that's what they're actually waiting for. It doesn't matter if they're going to the meeting or not. If the pain they're going through, like social media marketing at the moment, like so many brands are now waking up or businesses are now waking up to the fact that simply posting content is not enough. Like there's actually a science and an art to it. And they're scrambling now because the market's turned to learn that 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 science and the art. And so what I've started to find out is by making my calls, I had a guy who I rang the other day and I said, oh, hey, Jared, Jonathan Creek. Oh, hey, Jonathan, how are you going? And he started talking to me as if we were mates. And I was like, oh, do you? Do you, know, do you know who I am? And he goes, I may have been watching your videos for six months. I've been trying, I, actually a couple of times I was going to ring, call out to you, but then I got busy. And so he wishes, you know, on the phone, he was sort of saying, well, I wish we'd actually had this conversation six months ago. Uh, yep, send me the proposal, let's go. That easy. Folks, turn your minds around. Don't worry about what just other people make, are doing. Just make just, the call. If they're they, busy, they leave a voice have, message, yeah. don't ring back. They don't have to be sales calls, right? They don't. You know, if you've got a fear of rejection, don't ask them the question then. If you don't say, would you like my product? Are you thinking about buying my product? If you don't say those words, then you'll never get rejected. You just bring it up and say, g'day. And nine times out of 10, the customer's going to say, hey, tell me about your product. Tell me what you do. I need your product. Or I know someone who does need your product. Then mm. That's the conversation, right? But if you don't reach out and engage with those customers, you are really missing a big part of the market right now because most people are needing those conversations to move in any direction, all right? And I also think on the retreat, it was really, really interesting on the retreat when um, 
the guys, the high performance guys and girls were talking about how they form their habits and they don't let themselves break their habits. And so there was yeah. um, one guy, I think we can name him, can't we? His first name? Yeah. Yeah. So sure. Jono was talking about how he always makes his calls. Now, some days he reckons around the end of the week, he might not have calls to make. Like he might only have seven, but he still makes sure that he makes the 10 by calling yeah. a mate or family or friends, right? Just to get the block of 10 done every day. It's a habitual uh, thing that he does. I've made 10 calls. Now, the last three might not be as um, valuable as the first seven, but who knows? It might just be the trigger that a friend of his is having a conversation with someone who needs a real estate agent, and he's just put himself in front of the queue. But he's made Love the it. 10. And, and this is the discipline, right? And everyone makes up 5,000 excuses about why they can't, why they shouldn't, why they couldn't. Rah, rah, rah. At the end of the day, just pick up the phone, ring 10 people, and go tick. Job done. And you feel so much better. That sick, heavy feeling in your guts just disappears. Right? Now it. these now these lifesavers behind me are hanging over me like I'm feel. Oh, I should have got rid of them yesterday. Wouldn't have hey, had to worry about I told them, you. right? I told you. <laughs> I know how that eats away at you, man. I oh, know yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Right, number two. What is it? Technology, please. This is called the buyer's wish list. And one of the things that I want you to be thinking about, regardless of industry, regardless of business, is to have a think about those people that actually want to buy your product or service and actually be able to identify and to lay up what the options or what the choices would be for a buyer. So the one I've, we've got here is a buyer's wish list for real estate. And the whole point about this one is you can sit down with a potential buyer and actually get right down to exactly what they're looking for in their property. So this is a real estate buyer's wish list. And there's lots of different questions on here. I'm not gonna go through them all individually, but it's a very great way to be able to have bigger, stronger conversations with your buyers and to find out exactly where they are in the buying process. Do you want so me to bring again, the PDF up now? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can bring that one up now, mate. That's. Gee, we're smooth so, in our operation, is, aren't we? This is TV. This is, look at this. That's it. Perfect. So that's the buyer's wish list, right? Now, um, for those of you that want a copy of that, just go to my website, www.darrenprattley.com. Go to the shop um, up on the top uh, corner. Go in the shop. Go to free stuff. And this is in the free stuff section. So you can just simply download this and then use it in your conversations with your buyers because this is a really simple way for you to have a much bigger conversation, find out exactly where they're at, and actually be able to create a clearer plan for that. So um, that's a it's a really great tool for helping agents really get an understanding and owning their buyers. And what I encourage you to do is, let's say you've got 20 or 30 of these filled out with 20 or 30 buyers and you put them in a folder, when you go to a listing presentation, one of the things you can do is you can say to the homeowner, these are the 20 or 30 people that I'm actually working with at the moment as buyers. And from this group of people that there might be three or four of them that actually are in your target market or price range. So because you've done the work on that buyer's wish list, uh, it really does add another depth of conversation and a better way to engage with your buyers. Yeah, that's incredible. And yeah, you it would have particularly if you put it in that folder and it's physical, it's like the, mm. the potential vendor sitting there and already seeing the buyers physically, right? They're just on paper, yep. but it's way more convincing than, oh, I've got a great network. I've got the best network. Oh, I've got the buyers. greatest local oh, knowledge. Lots of buyers. Oh, yeah. lots of buyers. Lots yeah. of buyers. If you've got a folder full of actually signed Buy in documents... Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, great idea. You got great one. idea. Love it. Love it. Love it. Very good. Number three. Professionals Number three. Network. The Professionals this Network, one Darren. It's critical, mate. This one here. If you are, no matter what service provider you are, no matter what business you are, there will be other associated industry uh, industries or other professionals that are associated with your industry sector or product. What you need to do is to build a network of them. 
So if we're talking about real estate again, you go out there and you get a, your solicitors, you get your accountants, you get your valuer, you get your home stager, you get your cleaner, you get your landscape gardener, you get your electrician, your plumber, your um, building maintenance person, um, your building inspectors, any of those groups of people that you can pull together. And, and some of my offices will have 15, 20, 30 names in a list. So no matter what the customer need is, you've got a really good contact for them to solve whatever problem that they have. But the best part about this is next week at th on Thursday at five o'clock, you've invited all of the people on your professionals list to meet you for drinks or for a snack or for just a glass of wine even at a local venue where you can have a conversation. Now, by bringing all of that network together, they're going to be looking around the room going, wow, this agent really does know or this business really does know uh, how to run their, their business well. They've got great connections in the industry. They're a really great supplier. And this is somebody that we want to be associated with so that there's a sense of uh, reciprocal referrals going backwards and forwards. It really does help in terms of growing your network and engaging with the marketplace in a completely different way. Yeah, I know over here at the moment, because there is such a shortage of tradies um, and also like garden maintenance teams and stuff like that. Yeah. It's a really, yeah. really recruiting teams of those types of operators. And what they're even doing is they're sharing commissions for leads into appraisals and homes because these workers, you know, they've, if they're doing renos or fixing up rotten barge boards on homes and all that sort of stuff, they know the owner will slip in. Oh, well, we're getting ready to sell it. We need to fix a few things. So these guys get a heads up before they've even engaged an agent. They can ring right. the agent who's in their network and get a lead for it. Now, one of the other, so that, that's a great way to do it, particularly the gardening guys as well. Um, yep. But yeah, it's a great idea. If, there's, you know, you could even use technology and things. This may be a little bit uh, beyond you, Darren, but there's an app called Snapchat. I'm sure your beautiful daughter has Snapchat. Now, Snapchat, uh, Snapchat has a really interesting feature that most people in our age bracket find really creepy, but the kids and now young business operators and young agents are starting to use it to their advantage. Is that Snapchat? Snapchat has what's called Snap Maps. And that allows you to see where a person is at any time. Wow. And so what these agents are now doing, particularly in the holidaying areas, in the hot weather over summer, is that if they've got downtime or they're just driving neighborhoods, letterbox dropping or whatever, they see where their gardening network and maintenance guys are, and they take them a drink. Hey, boys, I was just wow. in the wood. Grab a drink out of my cold that's esky. Cool. That's cool, mate. That's, that's exactly it. That's exactly what you got to do. Yeah, and the, gar the gardeners are there going, "How'd you even know I was here? Like, what's going on?" Yeah. Oh well, six That's months ago clear. we became friends on Snapchat. Yeah. So many ways. That's to very it. clear. No, no, that that that's exactly it. Doing that sort of stuff really does, yeah, make make a easy way of connecting. That's that's very clever. All right, number four is investor discussions. Tell us about. Yeah, it. so the reason why this one. The reason why this one's here is because for me at the moment, there is lots and lots of different views about what's happening with investment type properties, what's happening with rentals, what's happening with the rent levels, um, what's the government involvement in the rent area for us here in New Zealand. So there's, you know, there's definitely a shortage of rental properties. There's a whole lot of taxation issues around uh, uh, that area of investors. So one of the things that I always say is, a group of people that you can always engage with at a, at a pretty consistent level is those that are invest, investors in residential property or, or even commercial property for that fact. It's just the ability to be able to connect with them on a regular basis. What's happening? What's the points of interest? What's going on? Just a general conversation. What are the challenges? What are the issues? And to be able to have that dialogue, which again helps you build that relationship engage with the market again in a different way so um, it's a really simple thing to do but it's a great group of people for us to be talking to yeah i think absolutely you're right uh i'll just have a little bit of a struggle here with uh the camera switching so let's get back to this one there we go i'm back sorry i went missing 100 percent, i think but i think also from a real estate point of view if you've got in your network someone who's into finance then bring them together with your investors. 
because Highly. there's a lot of yep. uncertainty. Um, yeah, it's not just in New Zealand where governments are getting involved in, you know, rental properties and rent shortages and rent affordability and they're trying to manipulate the market so that they can get votes at elections coming up and become popular. The problem is that, you know, when governments start interfering in stuff like this, landlords take their properties off the rental market. Uncertainty yeah. doesn't make them yeah. want to buy more. It makes them want to do less and say, you know what, this is too hard. I'm just going to not have it for rent and just let it sit there. I can afford or it. Or sell it. Well, they sell it, and then it's gone. So, um, yeah, because there's no shortage of uh, demand for, for properties at the moment, both rental and sales. So just sell it. I'll get a good price. I'll take my money and put it somewhere else because it's a lot easier. I mean, there are rental properties that you know may, once it's all said and done with your mortgages and the rates where they are at the moment, maybe you're going to make, you know, I don't know, on one of the cheaper ends, maybe 10, 15 grand a year cash positive. Yeah. But it's that ten to fifteen grand worth all the headaches of, you know, the government. You know, over here, particularly in Victoria, um, there's no rulings on pets anymore. So anyone can have anything that they want in your house, and you know they can have pit bulls, they can have whatever you want, and you can't stop it. Wow! And so it's almost like you've lost, you're handing over and losing control of your own home. So the agents got their work cut out for them to manage those relationships. That's for sure. But, um, yep. yeah, I think at the moment your investor relations are probably the most important because there's no shortage yep. of applicants for property, but there is definitely... So how, so how easy are those phone calls, mate? Hey, like those phone calls are a bit of a no-brainer, right? Keeping in contact with that group of people, you don't have to be pushing for a appraisal or a, you just have a conversation, right? So it's so much easier. And I think property managers will do a much better job than you and I do about what the actual rules are and where oh. the rights are and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, totally. help remove the fear of the unknown by just ringing them and saying, hey, yeah. have got any concerns? What's going on? You're thinking yeah. about buying any extras? I've got a couple of homes that I reckon would be really good. They match the ones that you got already. The numbers will add up. Like, give them the formula and let them pull the trigger if they're ready. Love it. Then you're Number five, face-to-face -face meetings, mate. Face-to-face -face meetings. One of the things I say to people all the time is track how many face-to-face -face meetings you have with clients each yeah. week. Yeah. So how many times did you actually get face-to-face -face with a potential customer each week and then track that number? Because one of the things that I see most of the time is people, that number dropping dramatically as this market's you know changing the way it is. People getting caught sitting in the office, not really doing what they should be doing, not creating the activity levels they should be doing. And then you start saying, well, okay, well, let's just have a look at how many conversations you've actually had with real people that have, that are in the market or potentially could be in the market sometime in the future. How many people have you talked to? And, and seriously, that number sometimes can be scarily low. You know, I'm, I'm saying like sometimes people say to me, they've said two or three discussions a week with, with live customers. And I'm like, for, for goodness sake, like we need to get that number to 10, you know, so for, that's two a day. So have a look at your diary. Are you doing two face-to-face -face with potential customers a day? If you were doing 10 calls a day, you should be able to secure two face-to-face -face a day. And that's got to be by doing that, you're engaging the market and that's what will flush out the opportunity. So you've really got to up those face-to-face -face meetings. Yeah, and I think in these scenarios, sometimes we can really look to other industries that maybe you and I aren't as focused on at the moment. Um, but I was in a big recruitment firm recently. So a big recruitment firm, 80 consultants, this guy. Yep. So 80 salespeople out there finding candidates and finding jobs and matching them together. Now, yep. when I was walking through his office, not in his actual office, but actually the floor where the consultants are, big TV on the wall with all these numbers and photos of the staff. And I'm like, well, what's going on there? Is that like, it looked like, it looked like almost the order number board at McDonald's when your number's up, right? But it had rankings. And I saw the word rank and I thought, that's really interesting. Ranking one to, I think it went to 40 halfway through. And what it was is who's leading, it was measuring who's leading the number of calls. So who's making the most calls? This system records it. Who's then booking appointments and who's succeeding with face-to-face -face meetings and then success and placement. And so it was a leaderboard. So, yeah, if that was me, I don't, you know, I don't think a recruitment consultant's my gig.
But if it was me, I'd be making sure I was on the top front page of that TV screen. I'd want to make sure I was on the top 10. Now, these guys know that it's so important to have those face-to-face meetings that they're just yeah. going to put it out there and they're just going to show the world, are you doing it or aren't you doing it? Nowhere to hide. Have you got this school board, have you got this school board in your office? No school board. Why not? Well, it'd be pretty boring because the first place would all also be last place. So it just be oh, would it? Sort of oh, oh, it just depends oh, on sort of mindset yeah. I was in, how I looked at it. <laughs> so, so this is the piece, right? So up there goes on the board. There's always two people, right? There's you and Joe Bloggs, right? So there's always Joe Bloggs is always in your office, right? And that's industry benchmark, yeah. right? That's industry benchmark. So Joe Blogg has always got his numbers up, which is 10 calls a day. He does two face-to-face meetings a day. What's your score up there at the moment? All right. So you're going to just put him there as the, okay, that's a great idea. Because I was going to put the dog so, up. So, so Joe, Joe is always industry industry benchmark, right? That's what Joe does. All right. Are you better than industry benchmark? That's my question. I'm pretty close to Joe this week, actually. I think I've had three, I've had three face-to-face. And I reckon I've made nearly 25 calls. Yesterday was a bit of a derailing because of the postage. I'm not, sure. I'm not sure I bought my violin in today. Did I bring my violin? I don't think I did. I'm not sure. No, I don't think I did. I didn't bring my violin today. Mm. Anyway, move on. You, I've made my point. <laughs> Joe so, Block. Eight insights to increase value in your home. Yes. Now, this is one that I reckon is a real no-brainer, right? So here's the thing. So if you're a good real estate agent, could you sit down with a blank piece of A4 paper and a glass of Pino and a pen, right? And if you were thinking about the the clients about to sell their home, what would be the eight insights that you would have to increase the value of that home before it came to market? Mm -hmm. We're not going to go through eight right now, but just you and me. What do you reckon? If you're going to increase the value of someone's home before they go to market what would be some things that would be on that list oh paint the window frames yep so to minor maintenance tidy up yep absolutely what else um uh, gardening gardening landscape tidy up uh deep clean inside yeah. making sure that um you declutter we declutter. actually call it in new zealand we call it pre pre-packing so yeah. we don't call it de- de- um, so pre-packing, so getting rid of some of the stuff out of the house, making it look bigger. So you, you've you got to make a list, right? And you'll get a list up to eight pretty easily. Yeah. Now, go to the marketplace and say to them, hey, I just want to let everybody know that I've got 10 key insights to increase the value of your home before you go to go to sell. It was eight. Now. Got an extra two, bonus two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just gave you two, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. so, so, so the whole idea here is that the customers that engage or want that list, who are they? They're looking to sell. Yeah, it's good. Data. So by sending that out, by sending that out to your database, sending it out to your local community, and you say to them, "Hey, I've got to, I've got eight ways. I've got eight ways to increase the value of your home. Give give me a call and I'll and I'll send it out to you. Don't send it out to them up front. They've got to actually inquire, right?" So what you're doing is you're making people that are actually wanting to to be in that position or thinking about going to be in that position in the future to contact you, and that gives you a good group of people, again, to add to your database and build relationships with. So that's an, another easy one to engage the market. But I say this all the time. I go to real estate office and I go, okay, so what are the eight ways that you have to increase the value of your home? They sit there and stunned and look at me going, that's a good question, Darren. I need to get onto that. So, so just being able to develop that list is actually really, really important to have. Yeah, I also think it's really important to, um, I think it's really, really important. I've just gone blank because I'm looking at technical issues again. Uh, it's really important to trigger that action. once you And you're saying, you know, don't go and see them. Don't go and uh, jump onto them. Don't send it to them straight away. Don't make it too easy. Make them inquire. And this is really important, folks, is that you've got to get people into the action of taking action Otherwise, you're going to meet with them and they're not going to be prepped or ready to actually bite the bullet and do what you need them to do. So um, it's really important that right from the start, you're making them, in a way, pursue you for what they need because that's going to be the filter between the time wasters and the action takers, no matter how big or small the action is. And that's where the, those say, that number six, eight in, insights, increasing the value of your home. If you can get that in a format where you can, you know, 
get it into the marketplace with collection of data off the back of that and build your build your connections of people who are seeing that as a hot topic brilliant like that that's a great way of engaging the market right now yeah and even outside of real estate i do it with uh, a story framework that i send out it's a really yeah. well designed brilliant. properly developed uh pdf download that I just send the link to and say, hey, who wants to learn how to tell better stories on social media or make their videos more engaging with the human brain? And I get people who Love reach out for it all the time. I send them the link, they download it. I get their email addresses, which means I can re-engage with them on that. But exactly what Love you're saying, it's telling me that they want to make videos on social media. And so, so I don't have to get... The worst client for me is the person who comes to me and says, I want to do it but I hate myself on video. I don't want to have to waste my first two or three sessions with them just actually getting them to push the button. I actually want the people who are ready or are already pushing the button and just want to get better at it. Better at it, yep, nice. All right, oh, it does All right. It does concern me a little bit. This is a bit of a side issue. You know I love to take you on a side issue. Why is number six not number eight? Seeing now you've got eight insights to increase value in your home, you should make that one number eight on your list, I reckon. Really? Yeah, for serendipity well, purposes. Oh, yeah, well, right, yeah. yeah, I could do. But let's go to number seven because number seven is a really good topic and I'm not letting you take me down that rabbit hole because number seven is social media content, mate. Now, tell me about this. If you want to engage the market, what's the sort of social media content you should be creating right now? Well, the, what you really should firstly be doing is recognizing that your experience is valuable. Your experience and your knowledge is valuable. And that's as simple as it is. Engage your market by sharing your knowledge and your value. Now, that sounds really simple. I oh, just go out there and speak. But you've got to do it in a way that's human to human. You've got to do it in a way that is uh, has a framework, has a story around it, because people are more, remember stories more than if you just spit facts at them. So we've seen a rush of it at the moment with increasing uh, interest rates and financial turmoil that we're just getting these people coming out and they're just spitting Reserve Bank of Australia and Reserve Bank of New Zealand statistics at us, and it's really dry oh, and boring. Yeah. So let's get some content out there that actually translates the jargon so that they can understand it and feel as though they're connecting with you because you've helped them comprehend oh. the bigger problems into simple bite-sized chunks that they can take with them. Think about this. Yeah, like if they can take the information that you're giving them, and regurgitate it to their friends, and it makes them feel like the expert among their friends group. They will never lose. They will never leave you, and they'll always come back to you for help because yep. you're making them Love it. rank higher cool. in their friends group. Love it. Very clever. Got that. Maybe Number eight. We do a podcast. That's right. There you go. Number eight is uh, marketing, creating a marketing campaign for this time of year. And one of the things I say to people is, what's your campaign? So we've just had spring, right? So we just, like, for some parts of Australia and New Zealand, we're still waiting for spring to arrive after yeah. a winter that just won't stop. Uh, but the, the, the catch here is to build a marketing campaign for the time of year you're in. So we know we know Christmas is around the corner. So build, start thinking about your, your Christmas campaign leading into Christmas so you can engage the market using that campaign. We should have had a spring campaign out by now. See, how did that go? Now, if... Don't talk if you're sitting in your <laughs> if you're sitting in your business right now thinking nah I didn't really have a campaign then go down to your marketing department give them a slap because as part of your business you know we need a marketing campaign leading into spring right because that's a, a really important time of the year for people to make buying decisions so you know you got to do got to put this stuff into place to make sure that we're doing it so creating a good marketing campaign for this time of the year is really really critical yeah, there's a real estate client of mine by the name of Chris Henry. He he runs River Real Estate up in uh, Maitland, New South Wales, and they've been smashed by floods. I think they've had three one in once in two hundred year floods this year. What he's really really into, and something he says all the time, is now in real estate is the time to harvest. So don't change yep. anything. Don't adjust too many things. You don't need to build two things. Just take what you've got and squeeze every bit of juice out of that lemon right here, right now. Spring marketing campaigns. Into Christmas campaigns. If you're in Melbourne, spring racing carnival, horse racing campaigns. Um, yes. Share your knowledge around that stuff. 
the new year, new year, new home campaigns. What are your aims for yeah. 2023? Oh, back yeah. to school well, end of January. Valentine's yeah, Day, well, February. Footy season starts in March. Easter campaign for April. That's it. You're done. You're done. I've just taken you from... I've just taken you from... What are we in now? October, November, December, January, February, March, April. Who says we don't give value on this podcast, Darren? I've just That's given you marketing what, team. You just created a marketing Perfect. campaign. Perfect, Perfect, right? That's exactly what it is. And when people say to me, oh, Darren, I haven't had time. I don't know. Seriously, you just did it in about nine seconds, right? This is the challenge that you've got to keep thinking about is having these marketing campaigns for the time of year you're in is a great way for you to engage your market, right? And this is why you've got to have it as part of your business, right? Yeah, we call okay. it a moment, moment of peak relevance. That's it. Love it. Mm. Oh, I like nine. that. That's very nice. I like that. Oh, I like that. Moment of peak relevance. Oh, I like that. Right. Good. Excellent. Number nine. Last one. Now, this is an interesting one, right? Now, I've got, this is all about, and this is very specific for real estate, but your ability to present your uh, product or your service to your customer, right? So what, what I want you to be thinking about here is if anyone comes into your store, comes into your business, or you go out to them and talking about your product, your ability to present that product and service proposition to that customer has to be not just good, it's got to be perfect. Mm. Now ask me why, John. Why does it need to be perfect? Well, because you're in a competitive environment. So if no, I see what you have to ask me why why. Darren, why would it have to be perfect? Because I don't like perfect. I like I like natural. Because for me, if it's not perfect, you may only get one shot at it. Yeah. You may only get one shot. If it's not practice perfect, you are, because this is what I see all the time. All these people do so much work to get these opportunities. They get the customer in the door and then do a shit job of their presentation, right? And then they go, oh, I haven't got any of them in stock. Oh, we don't have that. Oh, I haven't got that screwdriver. Oh, we can't show you this. We can't get into that. And you're like, for goodness sake, you've got the customer here. The presentation at that point has to be bang on perfect. Nothing more frustrating than when you when someone talks to you about or an agent raises a scenario in the house and you go, oh, really? Have you got paperwork on that? Can I see where that where that easement is? And then they spend the next five minutes shuffling around their papers. Oh, no, sorry, I don't have those plans with me today. And it's like, uh, mate, why did you why did you raise it and now leave me with what I call an open story loop, which I can't resolve, and my brain's just going to spin all day and catastrophize the fact that you've raised yep. this easement and now you can't prove what you've just said. And so now I'm not going to believe you my, and it's all going to fall apart. Right? My head in. It just does my head in, mate. It absolutely does my head in. And, and this is the piece where, you know, spending some time to nail that presentation so that it's absolutely bang on perfect. Mm. The customer experience at that moment is really handled well and that you end up in a situation where the customer goes, you know what? They really engaged with me. They engaged with my needs. They really showed me the benefit of their product against my needs and showed that they are the best solution for what I'm looking for. And, and that nowadays is just critical, right? You've got to do this. You've got to make sure those presentations are bang on. Yeah, and I think let's uh, give them a bonus one here. What makes a perfect presentation? Because in my mind, what I really, really, really drives me mad is that when I go in and a real estate agent gives me a presentation or walks me through a house and they're not listening to me, they're just regurgitating a script that doesn't answer my question. So you say something and they go, oh, yeah, sure, that's right. And then they'll go straight into a pre-rehearsed script. So that's when at the start I said, oh, I don't like perfect. I like natural or human. Um, what's the balance here for perfect? Of course, surely... You know, you can have your prepared script, but you've got to be so down on it that if a side issue comes in or a client, potential client asks something, that you're good enough to go off track, be human in your communication, and then come back to the key points without the words being word for word. Is that what we're looking for here? I, I am one who is a stickler for practice perfect, mate. So I push really hard on making sure you have a pretty tight 
uh, professional pitch because I totally appreciate the customers are going to take you down different tracks and my my expectation would be that you would be professional in answering any of those you know branches that they take you down but you must make sure that you bring them back to your core presentation that you take them through that process because you know after you've done a, a, a presentation 5 10 15 20 times you should know it like the back of your hand and and if the customer does take you off on a branch for a conversation then that's fine no problems at all and and you're dead right about being authentic and real and all of that stuff but also you need to be able to bring them back onto the the correct direction that you need to take them to get the result that they need but also that you're wanting as well so it's working um, around that practice piece so that you are good enough to be able to do that Mm, but there is a scenario, and this comes from my media background, is that you'd always get the younger, uh, rawer, uh, inexperienced journalists who, when they go to do a live cross, they've got a pre-rehearsed word-for-word script, right? Yeah. And yeah. the problem is yeah. if something happens and they drop a word yeah. or they drop a thing, they lose their way and then they scramble to find their way back. So what I'd be saying is, Understand the structure. It's like keynote speaking, right? Understand the structure. Understand the pathway of where you're going, where you need to get to. That's the most important thing, not the start, the end. So know where you need to get to, the points you need to hit, and you know maybe yeah. the order of those points isn't necessarily as important as making sure you don't stumble and lose your way. So you've got to hit these five points. These are the. This is the ideal order to do it in. But if you go from one yeah. to three... It's not that much of a disaster to go back to two and then finish with four no. and five. So, no, no. But I suppose that is practice and knowing your knowing your stuff. Uh, is oh, what's going to say. And, and, and that's the key, right? Is is making sure that you know your stuff so well that it is almost, in terms of my words, practice perfect, mate. Because because there is no point going into these sales situations that are worth twenty, fifty, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars a time and winging it. You know, and it's just, it, nowadays, it's just customers pick up on it way, way too quickly. Well, I think that's a great episode, engaging with the market. So we started with number one was 10 calls a day. Number two was buyer's wish list. And you got that download uh, from Darren's website, darrenprattley.com. Head to the shop. You can buy all sorts of things there, candles and all different things available in the shop. So you can download that for, in the free download section, Darren. Yep, it's in the free area. Yep, absolutely. In the free area. Then we're jumping. Number three was professionals network. So gather your professionals around. Use that network. Integrate them. Cross pollinate them. Get them all working together, and they'll become your best referral network you've ever had. Start having investor discussions when there's times of financial uh, complexities like we're going now. Investors are the key because they're going to be the first movers. Whether that's retreating yeah. or expanding, you just got to have those discussions. Often, just a little discussion can remove all their fears, and all of a sudden, you've got a client who wants to maybe buy another investor property or sell investor properties. Whatever they do, they're going to be the first to move. Five, the importance of face to face meetings. Make sure you're having two a week minimum or two a day. Two a day. Two a day. And this doesn't count, does it? Me and you, right here. No. Oh, damn. So, okay, we've got, I've, got, I've got work to do today, folks. All right, number six, which should actually be number eight, but that's a side issue we can take up in the Christmas tape. Eight insights to increase value in your home. Have your list prepared so that when you meet with people, this is real estate specific, but it could also be car specific, I suppose, and other industry yeah. specific. So what's, how are you going to increase the value of your offer? What are the eight things that you can do to increase the value of your offer? particularly your home, it's easy to do. Number seven, get onto social media and start those conversations because those social media conversations lead to phone calls. Those phone calls lead to face-to-face. -to -face. The amount of people that I meet at conferences and different things who come up and slap me on the back as if we're mates, it's incredible. I've never met them. Darren, you and I yeah. stayed at your house recently. I'd never met you before, but we've been conversing yeah. for, what, nearly four or five years on social media. Yeah. The relationship was real. The feelings are real. Uh, it's, it works, folks. If you're not doing it, you're missing out. And if you wait to start after Christmas, you're going to wish you started before Christmas because everyone's going to start after Christmas and then you're just in the pack. Number eight, marketing campaign for this time of the year. 
very simple. We gave you six months worth of ideas just within nine seconds. I mean, pretty boring video if we'd just taken that topic. It would have been over in nine seconds. And number nine, listing presentation and presentation perfect. Know your stuff. Just know your stuff. That's it. Like, That's it. have a structure that your presentation slots into. So all you actually have to really be learning is what are the unique parts of this property that fit in to your ongoing evergreen presentation structure. It's like a story framework. You need this bit, that bit, then you go to that bit, then you flip around to that other key point, and then you finish with your core sales piece that closes the deal and you're done. All right? Just change, it. Just change the data. So there you go. There's Darren's Engage with the Market Top 9. I reckon it was awesome. I thought it was a great episode. Um, I thought your performance was okay. Mine was pretty ordinary, but you you were right. And uh, I think, you know, it's just great to be back. And are, we, about are, we self are we, we self-critiquing now, Creaky? Is that the plan, is it? We've yeah, well, you know, yeah, self-awareness is really important, Darren. If you, if you haven't brought oh. your A game, you know, it's important to acknowledge it so that next time you do do it, you do bring your A game. We're all about improvement yeah. here on Blink. Right. My job now is to go and meet face to face with a customer and uh, organise a uh, very engaging and enlightening conference presentation. So that's my job for the rest of the afternoon. So it's good to see you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here. Good to see you, Jonathan. And we'll uh, catch up with you all in the next episode of the Blink Podcast. See you all. Peace. See you soon, everybody. <laughs>